Now we start getting a little bit more into the theory of linear algebra, and we get into the concept of vector spaces. What is a vector space? Well, I put a little definition up here. I typed it so it saves you from having to read my handwriting up here. A vector space consists of four things. First, a set of vectors, a set of scalars, and then I combine three and four because there are two operations. Scalar multiplication, so a number times a vector, and then vector addition, meaning you're adding two vectors together. We're talking about things like matrices and functions, so a set of vectors could be a matrix. It could be some sort of a function. We're creating spaces where a set of rules apply. So, for example, you got a house, right? There are certain rules that would determine whether or not you go in that house. So the house has rules. Can you call yourself a member of the house or not? Well, can you call yourself a vector space or not? Depends on whether or not you meet all the criteria. So there is a definition of a vector space that has 10 parts to it, right? There are 10 things that define what a vector space is. So if you have a vector space that involves addition and scalar multiplication, I'm going to sort of sketch it out here. You can read the whole thing in the textbook, but I've got vector u, vector v, and vector w. Suppose those things are vectors in some big set v. And I've got scalars C and D. So I'm going to try to use lowercase for scalars. And then the vectors have the little arrows on them so you know the difference between them. All right, so here's how I define a vector space. If something really is a vector space, then all 10 of these things are true. The first thing is there has to be closure under addition. So if I take vector V plus vector U, that sum has to be in the in the space v. So v is some set. Right? It's a set on which those two operations hold. So if I add the two vectors, the vector is also in the set. Right? That's what we call closure. In this case, is closure under addition. Right? The commutative property holds. If I add two vectors together, it doesn't matter which order I add them in, because if addition is commutative, and vector addition is just taking the two components individually and adding them, then the commutative property holds for vector addition as well. All right, the associative property holds. So if I have vector u plus vector v, add it together and then add it to vector w, that's the same thing as taking vectors v and w and adding them together first and then adding u. So I can add vector u and then v plus w. All right, there has to be a zero vector. And that zero vector serves as the additive identity. So in other words, vector u plus some zero vector gives me back exactly the same thing. It also has to have an additive inverse. If that set does not have an additive inverse, then it's not a vector space. So if I have vector v, there has to be some vector that's the opposite of v that will give me the zero vector. Right? It has to have closure under scalar multiplication. Meaning that if I multiply a scalar times a vector, then the scalar times the vector is in the big set V. Right, the distributive property has to hold. If I multiply a scalar times the sum of two vectors, then it becomes a scalar times the first vector plus the scalar times the second vector. All right, the last three, well, two of them are just the way that we multiply scalars. So if you take the sum of two scalars multiplied by a vector, then you can distribute scalars. So the seven and eight are actually both distributive properties. The first one is distributing a scalar to two vectors. The other one is distributing two scalars to the same vector. And these are going to look very much like those same rules from before. All right, the last two down the bottom. If I take a scalar times a scalar times a vector and I multiply the first or the second scalar times a vector, I can also group the two scalars together and then multiply that by the vector. So I could do 
c times d multiplied by the vector. And then the last rule is a scalar identity. So if I multiply the number 1 times a vector, I get back the same vector. So we're going to call that the scalar identity. Right? If all 10 of these hold, then it's a vector space. If one of them does not hold, then it's not a vector space. Now, if something fails, where does it usually fail? It usually fails at closure, right? So closure under addition, closure under scalar multiplication, um, sometimes having a zero vector or an additive inverse, but the closure one is first. Um, and then you usually start looking at other things like does it have a zero vector, does it have an additive inverse, and so forth. Um, not often does it fail at distributive property. I mean, it's certainly possible you can find a set that is not a vector space solely because it fails a distributive property. But things like closure under addition and scalar multiplication and zero vectors and additive inverses, um, that's oftentimes where they fail. So let's take a look at some sets. And the big question is, is the set a vector space? So suppose I start with R2. R2 is the set of all ABs. Yes, that's an easy one, right? That follows all of those rules. If you add two vectors together in R2, you'll get a vector out in R2. If you do a scalar multiple of a vector in R2, you'll get another vector in R2. You can take two vectors in R2, change their order, add them together, and you still get the same vector. Same thing with R3, right? R3, set of all vectors A, B, C, yes, that's a vector space. How about some ones that are going to take a little bit more work to do? Let's take a look at M22. M22 is a set of all 2 by 2 matrices. Is that a vector space? Well, let's run through a few of the possibilities. All right, if I add a 2 by 2 matrix to another 2 by 2 matrix, then the answer is a 2 by 2 matrix. So it has closure under addition. If I multiply a scalar times a 2 by 2 matrix, then isn't the answer also a 2 by 2 matrix? All right, so that was a lousy choice here. Let's make this a C sub 1. All right, so this is closure under scalar multiplication. All right, is it possible to come up with a zero vector? Yeah. If you have an A11, A12, A21, A22, and you add it to another matrix called negative A11, negative A12, negative A21, negative A22, you will produce a matrix that is the zero matrix, or as we might call it, the zero vector. So yes, this has an additive inverse. It also has a zero vector, right? Right here is the zero vector. Right? You can multiply a scalar times the sum of two vectors, right? So you can do a scalar times a matrix plus another matrix, and that will be the equivalent of the scalar times the first matrix plus that same scalar times the second matrix. You can multiply the matrix by the number one, and you'll get exactly the same matrix. So it turns out that two by two matrices satisfy all 10 properties. So M22 is a vector space. Turns out that you can go even more general than this. It's also true that the set of all m by n matrices is a vector space. Because think about it, suppose you had a 3 by 7 matrix. And you added a 3 by 7 matrix to another 3 by 7 matrix, your answer would be a 3 by 7 matrix. If you had a 3 by 7 matrix, you could take the opposite of that matrix and produce the 3 by 7 0 vector and so forth. All right, let's take a look at some other types of vector spaces or maybe things that are not vector spaces. So suppose I have a set, right? This is a set. Set V is 
the set of all n by n singular matrices. Remember, singular matrices are matrices that don't have an inverse, or I could say a matrix where the determinant is equal to zero. So let's pick a matrix. Let's pick matrix A to be the matrix 1, 0, 0, 0. And matrix B is the matrix 0, 0, 0, 1. Now, would you agree that these are both singular matrices? The determinant of each matrix is 0, right? 0 minus 0, 0 minus 0. So both of those are singular matrices. I don't want to go through all 10 of them, so I don't know. Randomly, let's pick closure under addition, which I guess is the first one on my list anyway. If this is closed under addition, then when I add the two matrices together, the sum will also be a matrix that has a determinant of zero. So in other words, the sum will be a singular matrix. The question is, is that true? Let's find out. So let's add A plus B, and that gives me the matrix 1, 0, 0, 1. Ah, well, the determinant of A plus B is 1, which makes it non-singular. Once it fails 1, then that set is not a vector space. Because it turns out that I can add two matrices that are singular and come up with a matrix that's non-singular. So, not a vector space. All right, let's take a look at another one. Suppose I look at P sub 2. P sub 2 is a set of all polynomials of degree 2 or less. So I can have linears in there. I can have constants in there. That's okay. Is this thing a vector space? Well, what does this look like? It looks along these lines. P of x equals a sub 0 plus a sub 1 times x plus a sub 2 times x squared. Suppose you added one of these polynomials to another polynomial. Would you come up with another polynomial that's of degree 2 or less? Sure you would. Suppose you had q of x equals b sub 0 plus b sub 1x plus b sub 2x squared, and you added them together, you would get a sub 0 plus b sub 0 plus a1 plus b1x plus a2 plus b2x squared. So it would still be a polynomial of degree 2 or less. Here's another important idea. What if two of these numbers were opposites? Like what if a sub 2 and b sub 2 were opposites? And in effect, what happened is this thing became a 0, and you only had the constant term and the x term. Does it still belong to that set? Yes, because of those two words, because it was degree 2 or less. So I come up with an answer that does not have a degree that's higher than 2. It has one that's less than 2, but that's OK. All right, what other properties could you have on here? The commutative property, I could add q and p in either order, and I still come up with the same polynomial. The associative property holds. There is a zero vector, right? If a sub zeros and b sub zeros are opposites of each other, and the a1, b1, and the a2, b2, I've added them together, and I've created the zero vector, which is just 0 plus 0x plus 0x squared. The multiplication, the scalars, the distributive, all of that holds. So it turns out that, yes, all 10 properties hold, and this thing is a vector space. Right? It turns out that all continuous functions on the real number line are a vector space. Polynomials are a vector space. Um, functions in general are a vector space, but not ones that are not continuous. So they have to be a continuous function. So continuous functions. on the real number line, make a vector space. In other words, not things like 1 over x. 1 over x is not a continuous function. We could write it in a different way, right? Sometimes you'll see it written as the set of all continuous functions from negative infinity to infinity. Or you might look at the set of all continuous functions on an interval. So this is the set of continuous functions, or I should say the set of functions, 
continuous on a certain interval. So on the interval from A to B. Right, and I already sort of mentioned the notation before about P sub N being polynomials of degree N or less. All right, so P sub 2 was a set of all polynomials of degree 2 or less. All right, let's look at another one, and this one's going to be sort of specific in the directions. Let's say I looked at vector or at set V as the set of all polynomials of degree 3. So set of all degree 3 polynomials. And I want to know... Is it a vector space? Well, suppose I have two functions. Let's say p of x is x to the third plus x squared, and q of x is negative x to the third plus x. All right, so the first thing I'd like to check is closure under addition. So if I add p of x plus q of x, I get x squared plus x, but I don't get a third degree term, right? These two things drop out. Now, you notice what the question said. The question said it had to be degree 3. It didn't say degree 3 or less. It didn't say p sub 3, right? That would be degree 3 or less. This one said they have to be a degree 3 polynomial. Well, the sum here is not a degree 3 polynomial. So this is not a vector space. Once you find one thing that doesn't work, you're done. You don't have to go through and find every place where it doesn't work. Once you've found one, you're good. All right, here's one. How about the set of integers? Is that a vector space? Well, if you add two integers, you'll get another integer. How about scalar multiplication? Suppose I took a scalar, multiplied it by an integer. Ooh, that thing is not an integer. So no, the set of integers, not a vector space. So you can have very large sets of numbers that are not vector spaces. A set of integers meets some of the criteria. You can add integers together and get another integer. But don't forget that scalars can be negative. They can be fractions. They can be radicals. So sometimes scalar multiplication is a quick way to figure out whether or not something is a vector space. All right, and the next one, we'll take a look at subspaces of vector spaces.